Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the fifth Algorithmic Sound Masterclass. Today, I'm excited to be joined by my friend and composer, Matthew D. Gant. Matthew is a CUNY alum. We met when he was getting his master's at Brooklyn College, and ever since then, I've been inspired by his music and our conversations about performing and composing with technology. One of the central concepts of Matt's work is the spatial characteristics and embodiment of electronic sounds. I remember him showing me a piece years ago where he was using uh, something like 10 speakers on stage to create this metaphor of the speakers as a live ensemble rather than as an invisible source of disembodied sound, which has been a really exciting idea to, to grapple with. Um, and it makes sense to me that this kind of thinking led to his current work uh, in virtual reality where every sound is given an uncanny virtual physicality. Matthew releases with Orange Milk and Oxtail Records and has taught at too many places for me to list out right now. And he's currently a PhD candidate at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in the Electronic Arts Program. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Matthew D. Gant. All right, cool. So let's see if we can't brave the screen share. We'll kind of introduce a cast of characters, some of these instruments that we're developing. So, welcome home, here's Ableton. What I wanted to do is just kind of run through a few instruments I've built in Ableton. Some of these might actually sound familiar to some of you, and then we can maybe kind of extrapolate from there, sort of the why and the how of it. So here is, oops, let's see, yeah, yeah. A nice kind of voice stack with uh, the FM synthesis. Terrible, tacky MIDI flute and upright bass. Um, here is more of an instrument system uh, with that same voice uh, and a marimba. And right now, I'm pumping in MIDI through the keyboard, so nothing too esoteric. Um, You're just using the, the computer keyboard? Exactly right. Gotcha. And you know, it, it's funny, actually, I've got sort of a personal rule that <laughs> there's There'll, at no point in the compositional process, I've, I'm, this is probably anxiety influence with, uh, with Mort Spotnik, but um, I, I've got a personal rule that I'll never use a sort of black and white keyboard MIDI controller. So I always try and make, make these things ve very bereft of any sort of human gesture if this sounds like someone playing in you know, a lead line. Here is a little nested rack of samplers. We'd probably go into sort of the, the guts of this here in a second. But... <laughs> Language. You know, wow. it's funny, I've, throughout all my time kind of learning about this, I sort of neglected all the GRM, Pierre Schaefer, like um, Roland Kane, Parmigiani stuff, and just recently I've been falling down the rabbit hole, so I've been finding myself kind of drawing from that a little more dissonically. Kind of an old favorite uh, is this system of, it's just an Ableton guitar preset with this nice little Max for Live device where you turn a knob and it makes MIDI notes. Um, th this one might actually sound somewhat familiar, but um, as you turn this, you just get this awful, you know, beautifully banal sort of Van Halen, you know, Ingve Malmsteen shred. <laughs> Um, I think for, for, for many of us that, you know, maybe have a background in, in acoustic instruments or sort of performance going into electronic music, there's always these questions of sort of, you know, where the instrument is, what the gesture is, what the question of embodiment is, you know, how much of this is sort of a system or a ready-made or a media object versus how much is this a composer or performer playing an instrument. Um, and I, I definitely take some joy in having, having struck on this little system and finding myself, you know, playing this very characteristically embodied, you know, foot on the gesture, you know, on the monitor gesture, you know, in the most sort of disembodied way possible. <laughs> so that's when I find myself coming back to a lot. This is a good example of the kind of uncanniness that's mm. in your music a lot, where it's like sort of in limbo between very, it sounds like a real electric guitar, but it also sounds very MIDI, which I think is exaggerated by the, the like Nan Caro-ness of the midi shredding and then there's also something where it's it's sort of uncannily corny almost but not quite you know i don't know if that sort of resonates with you at all um just the sort of in-betweenness of the types of instruments that you choose yeah yeah no that, that that's that's beautifully said and yeah i think they're, they're you know it's funny actually even being on the series um and you know so, someone who i think 
maybe sonically I don't take after, but I think conceptually, you know, Mark Fell has been this huge, huge point of reference for me. So, you know, when you're dealing with this technology, you're not only dealing with sort of a tool to do something, but you're dealing with this kind of collection of media signifiers. And you're typically dealing with um, a set of commercial technology that has this sort of recursive relationship between there's a market that, you know, maybe wants like, you know, like a, you know, like a, you know, I love it on Instagram for a while. I was getting this, this, um, this targeted ad for these, um, these software guitars. And it would just say, you know, in this like monster truck, you know, like, are you ready to shred? And, you know, it's like, well, I, I, I don't, maybe, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but this idea, right. That, you know, it, is it sort of a translation of, of a guitar or is it kind of this media object unto itself? And then as someone that's sort of working with this, um, like you're saying, this question of how you're going to actuate that in performance, you know, and are you sort of approximating it? Or is there this kind of Nancro player piano? Let me take this, let me sort of just place it almost as a sonic ready-made and actuate it in this way that does actually try and celebrate that uncanniness and actually foreground that rather than treating as that as something to ignore. Um, and, you know, I, I guess it's worth acknowledging too. It's, it's, it's funny, um, you know, Sophie who just passed and, you know, RIP, um, I remember reading a lot of interviews with her and just talking about like, this notion of the sounds, sort of the materiality of the sounds, like this sound sounds like metal, the sound sounds like latex, the sound sounds like rubber stretching or something. And, and, and the notion that these things can be very tactile. And I think what, what's exciting to me then is taking that tactile nature from it and sort of divorcing it from what it's supposed to be in a way that hopefully kind of sheds some light on the larger cultural context of it. And then also allows you this new inroads into working with it sonically that would be less encumbered by the, by these questions of performativity or, or, or embodiment. It's just such an interesting connection between the kind of uh, like Noah Shrevsky hyper-realism and the Sophie more current hyper-pop aesthetic and the sort of in-between uh, world of orange milk artists like yourself. And yeah, yeah. yeah. It, but I feel like that's kind of a, uh, an interesting starting point for this conversation to think about like the sounds that we're using and then the types of MIDI gestures that are going to be feeding those types of sounds. Thank you for bringing up Noah. I'm um, also sadly another RIP, but another CUNY alum in uh, Brooklyn College Center for Computer Music. And yeah, and these weird points of resonance where I remember being aware of him and this whole notion of hyper real music and sort of going from tape collage just as sort of a practical way of working with technology to sort of this ethos of decontextualization. He's kind of going away from an accusmatic type thing where it's just, oh, well, this is just sound material. We're sculpting it into, you know, these things have cultural resonance. These things have association. These things operate as signifiers. And, and yeah, it was, it was very strange than ending up on the same label with him for a while too. Yeah. But like that definitely helped place it. Because I think what, what's funny is, you know, you see these libraries, you know, oftentimes I think they're used to, you know, make, sort of the, the most efficient, most pragmatic, cheapest, you know, bad Marvel Hollywood score where, you know, get a very evocative, you know, violin run and the timpani swell and then the big, you know, transformer sound or what have you. Um, and then, you know, taking these things that are expecting one type of gesture and then giving them this kind of nancro, this sort of disembodied thing and sort of finding where those points of rupture are and then foregrounding them, I think, I think can become really interesting. Um, and actually, yeah, maybe that's a, that's a good one into another one, which, um, so maybe I'll just, I can just play you this rack, then maybe we can kind of connect that back to these notions of, of performativity and gesture. So this, this is an instrument rack, and let me just kind of play it for you, and then maybe I can actually show you a bit of the guts of it. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I that's that, i mean that was a, a perfect example of you know a synth that has this very weird uh corny quality to it but when you give it these spastic gestures that you wouldn't normally expect from something like that it it it's just yeah it's perfect <laughs> yeah um, but you know it's <laughs> Funny, I remember, you know, going to sort of composition school and, you know, being, you know, getting very hip, you know, these kind of like Nancro or, you know, New Complexity or, you know, Boulez or Stockhouse and all all these, this idea of gesture, right? You know, and, you know, I think I was someone that, you know, despite having gone through some of this training, I feel like was never particularly good at, you know, getting that down on the page. And then finding, I think, kind of this intersection with, you know, media theory and electronic music, these kind of cultural and social and kind of questions of simulation translation sort of intersecting with being steeped in these questions of gesture and then finding that intersecting in the space between 
what does this technology mean and what is my relationship to it, both as a physical human and as a as composer trying to make something hopefully interesting? And then that becoming activated in, like you're saying, these kind of these bonkers gestures that are, you know, you know, maybe hopefully like equal parts kind of dumb and, and you know, interesting and you know, equal measures in a, in a way that can be generative. Uh, yeah. We have a question in the chat. What is happening under the hood with the Vocalese device? So maybe you could walk us through this chain of things and then we can talk a little bit about the synth itself, the Vocalese. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's that's a great point. You know, it's, and it's funny too, because I feel like this kind of zone of working with Ableton, you know, even before we hop into the Mac stuff, um, you know, it, it, it's funny that I feel there's this bifurcation where I think, you know, after folks start working with Ableton for a while, it either becomes like, oh, well, you know, of course you're going to put three arpeggiators into a slew, into a random, into a, you know, it's like, oh, you know, who doesn't do that? You know, versus like, wait a minute, where, I just, I just you know, I'm just penciling in the, the, the 808, you know, what what is, what's this? Um, so, I, yeah, definitely full kind of welcome both the questions of like, what on earth is this? Or, you know, don't you think this is a bit obvious? <laughs> um, sure. So the, Start with, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I think in, it by no means is sort of an innovation in, in, in of mine, but I find myself working this way a lot. So this, this is just kind of an instrument rack um, where there's a lot of different MIDI processing stacked uh, and then kind of embedded. And uh, let me, let me see if I can just kind of run us through the signal chain here. Also, just as an aside, too, before I, before I kind of tear this apart, it's funny. I think maybe for some of the conceptual reasons we were talking about before, um, I very, very rarely do any sort of audio processing. I, I, I don't think I use any audio effects mm. uh, beyond the, and that's not a hard and fast rule, but, you know, beyond the, the sends. But I feel like I've always kind of been drawn more towards MIDI processing and then treating these presets or the, the, these, in, these kind of instruments as sort of sound optics or ready-mades and finding ways to build structures around them rather than sort of the, you know, I recorded you know, the car wash and ran it through 30 comb filters. <laughs> wow. That's, that's so interesting. I didn't know that about your process, but it, it, I love that challenge of, you know, for me, if I'm using something and it doesn't sound right, I'll pitch shift it down a fifth and distort it and compress it. And I'm like, all right, now it's better. Now it sounds, you know, it's got the vibe or whatever, but you know, I like the idea of not being able to do that as a default you know, oh, totally. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. I think it's just, it's, it's, it's you know, this, I, I, you know, I don't know if it's any sort of like faux, you know, ready-made conceit of, well, let me just think on what this kind of weird purple wizard is about. And let me kind of excavate that, <laughs> you know, somehow I've landed there. Um, but yeah, in, in terms, in terms of kind of the nuts and bolts of it. Um, so what's happening is this is just an Ableton instrument rack. So it's just kind of a few instruments stacked. So there's a, there's just going to be a nice little funky you know, little FM sound. There's a, a pad on top of that. What and is then, that uh, operator? Oh yeah, I think th these are all just little operator ones. Okay, you know? okay. Yeah, and if I remember, the, you know, these might even be, might even be pre. I think these are actually even just presets. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, actually, kind of apropos, no, nothing too special about any of them. Nice little, you know, you know type thing. But <laughs> and then you know, th this one's a little sassier. So th th this is um, uh, a little vocal. I'm sure. You know, some of the some of the BCCCM colleagues could tell us, you know, this, this is kind of a four minute filter going, but it's just a really old kind of tacky speech kind of four minute. Z, 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 then it different z, notes and it will b, b, mm, alarmingly silly um you know sounds. <laughs> um, and then is it just um different notes trigger different uh like syllables or something? It is, yeah. And I think under the hood it's actually just kind of parsing those, you know, so maybe Actually, we can kind of find that. So I think C1 through C2. E yeah, so I'm just going to go in and then. Mm. Into the second opposite, yeah. yeah, so you get the, and then it just kind of tops out. I guess you go go to the Z's and you're, you're out of alphabet. This is maybe a, a, a rabbit hole that maybe is, will off-road us into unproductive territory. But um, one of the other things I'm, I'm always just really, really charmed about, and you know, whether it's kind of music production or, you know, virtual reality or just anything is these kind of weird moments before I think technology, like commercial technology really got like sexy or of interest to the mainstream. So you see just all these bonkers kind of like, oh, well, you know, of course, let's put a cartoon wizard on it. That's a great, you know. You know? <laughs> right, right. It's, oh, it's free, good. like flat aesthetic. Yes, yeah. yes. I, you know, I think this is, yeah, maybe, maybe the same thing where, you know, the, the same, you know, 
ethos in which, you know, something like Clippy seemed like a good idea. You know, I, th I think that's <laughs> very charming. Um, you know, so they, they've kind of like, you know, built, uh. they give you a little filter. But, you know, kind of same bit. You know, I never really touched that. But so, uh, 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 uh. so combined in that, in that staff. Uh, uh, um, you know, of a pad, a kind of plunky FM synth, and then this, this sort of uh, weird sort of speech synthesis situation and then kind of working backwards um and, and this kind of maybe this, this kind of goes into these larger questions of structure too but i'm always interested so all right so here's kind of this aggregate here's this kind of rauschenberg-esque assemblage of detritus you know here here's this thing and you know, sorry how can we activate it and you know i mean not not that i think this is going to be anything on a you know particularly you know hot track or whatever, you know, but like this question of like, all right, so now we have this instrument, what do we do with it? You know, is this sort of a, a material, you know, is this kind of a, a sculpture an object unto itself? And, you know, maybe this is a lot of high fluid and talk for like saying, all right, so I put an arpeggiator on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, there, there's this idea of, right, how do, how do we activate? You know, I don't necessarily just want to like put on the MIDI guitar and play this voice. I don't want to, you know, you know, bash some things on the drum pad. So how can I sort of activate it in something that has this gesture, but sort of kind of foregrounds the kind of weirdness of it. Kind of all conceptual talk aside, maybe the, the nuts and bolts of this is kind of working through the chains. Kind of uh, the first one is, just, uh, is, and these are all just kind of stock MIDI uh, mm -hmm. able effects, is just a random. So right now I'm just going to kind of bash out the, uh, just a C1 note on, on the keyboard. So, you know, every time we play, we get, we get a different note. Let's see. So then I'm going to throw in the chord. So it's going to take that one note and it's going to offset it. So we're going to get a, you know, a minor third above, a uh, minor seventh below, and you know, minus four. So I'm embarrassing myself as someone who's studied music. That's a flat six. Yeah, flat six below. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so what's going to happen then is every time it receives a note, I'm just going to play the same note on my keyboard. It's going to randomize that note. So we're going to get a random note out and then it will offset that stack of chords. Um, so let's hear that real quick. And it's going to be pretty gnarly. Um, yeah. So the wizard is mono, but the other synths are... Yeah, read my mind too. And then already we're getting some rupture, you know, between like just getting this instrument to do the, you know, because it's this weird aggregate of things that really probably no sensible person would kind of use together. <laughs> so you're getting this this pad with this kind of... You, I, I, you know, I don't know how under the hood, how that max optics is handling the MIDI, uh, the, the incoming MIDI, but you do hear a little bit of a glitch of it trying to parse those multiple notes. Um, right. So already you're getting, a little, you're getting a little bit of a rub between there. So we're getting this kind of thing. Uh, and then what we can do, um, and again, this is kind of the thing where I think probably for half of the people, it's like, oh yeah, of course, of course you'd put a random into the scale object, into the whatever. And then for the other folks that are like, you know, what on earth? So again, uh, welcome any comments or questions in either direction. Um, but because we're getting that random and because it's not diatonically pitch shifting, it's just giving us a straight offset. Um, I'm, and again, this is kind of a stock uh, Ableton MIDI effect. Uh, is just, I'm gonna constrain all those notes to a scale and a, a, both a, a bit of trivia and a confession uh, is I think every bit of music I've made is in C mixolydian. <laughs> 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 so it's kind of like a very dumb, like mixed in key version when I'm putting together the live set. <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm uh, I'm I do C, C major for literally every project, and then recently I was like, I gotta mix it up, and I did some B flat major. <laughs> oh, look, all right, oh, yes, yeah, the you know, it's funny. I imagine kind of the Casa Blue phase, it's like, oh, I remember when <laughs> I remember when Jake pivoted, you know, we got into Dorian. Um, and you know, I, I you know, I think that can be like it can. Well, actually, this, you know, this is a bit of Mark Fell anxiety of influence, too, but there's this really great um, article he wrote in The Wire where he talks a lot about sort of like categorical difference versus nuance difference. Uh, and this notion of like, you know, you know, that kind of a category of like the awful kind of like classist ethnomusicologist or musicologist that will like do the thing where they'll write out like a TR-909 pattern. And, you know, in, in sheet music, you'd be like, well, there is no complexity here, you know, just, just look at quarter note, you know. And the idea then is that, you know, well, if you map the framework of that and you're looking for interest, or you're looking for discourse around it, you're kind of missing, you know, what is just a nuance in, in one discourse, you know, like, oh, is it forte, is it piano forte, is it, um, you know, whatever, to this idea of like, oh, well, actually, there's all this very rich discourse in timbre, and the timbre actually becomes a categorical difference. And, you know, what, you know, what the, the, the harmonic difference, it, it, it's relevant, you know, and I think 
probably similar because I remember listening to your tape, you know, <laughs> and, you know, at no point, you know, it's like, oh, this is only C major, you know, how, how elementary, you know, how banal. Um, yeah. And, you know, in, in a way, too, I think something like this, then it is just a cheap way of kind of being able to leverage all of this random and then kind of give it something that will be. Mm -hmm. But I think it also gives a scaffolding to say, all right, well, how do we get into the gesture? How do we get into the timbre? How do we get into these other? But so, all right. So now that we've got that constrained, it's, it's going to be kind of similar. Oh, so we're still hearing a bit of that friction between the monophonic kind of speech synthesizer and then these kind of uh, pads going. So then, so then the one other thing um, that's happening after, and another kind of classic thing is the arpeggiator into the scale object. Um, but this is actually doing this backwards. So we've got that. So we play a note, and I'm just playing the same note on my end. We're randomizing it. We're offsetting it into a chord, then constraining it to a diatonic mode. And then, so coming out of here, um, I don't know if my mouse is going on the screen share, but you can see it on the- Yeah, yeah. it's visible. Yeah, so on the scale object. And then what this is gonna do is the arpeggiator. And it's the arpeggiator in the chord trigger mode. So rather than taking three notes going do 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 it's actually just playing those as, as block chords. So it's gonna sort of play those in octaves. Um, so it'll play the same block chord going up. And that's kind of going back to that, that, that Nancro idea that you mentioned, you know, I think this is, I doubt, you know, again, any sort of sane person would be playing this anyway. But, you know, it's a very non-human, it's a very uncanny sort of gesture. Um, so with that engaged, I'm going to play, you know, very low octave, so we have kind of space and headroom to go up to seven octaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we get that. And, all right, so then I think this is actually where sort of the the, the, the kind of the, the, the magic happens, or at least I think where it sort of activates beyond this. You know, that's kind of fun, maybe fun and expressive, what have you. But th this is a trick, actually, I, I learned from Wart, and I, I feel like this is an anxiety input as well. But this idea of when you're kind of designing instruments, where you're kind of building things, this notion of, of modulation, and not just saying one bit of modulation to one parameter, but ganging up one bit of modulation to multiple parameters. So th these things feel very organic, so they kind of feel very, if not real, they feel hyper real. And, you know, we see that in instrument design, that, you know, when you play a violin, you play louder, the timbre is also changing, the same with an electric guitar or anything. So it's not just, and I think one of the things that we, the reasons we find MIDI instruments very cold is because oftentimes, you know, when you pencil it in, you're not dealing with changes in velocity, you're not dealing with anything else. So it's like, you're, you're just kind of these Lego blocks of blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. But when you start tying things together, what's exciting is I think you can bring back some of that complexity is not the word, but you know, just some of that, that, that tactility. But the other thing is you can actually really lay into like, these uncanny relationships, like maybe as the filter opens, the sound goes from left to right, or you know, moves around space. Or um, in so in this case, uh, the example of it is normally I'll have a, a MIDI controller. Right now, I've just got it mapped to a macro, so I can turn multiple things at once. Um, but so there's two points of control I've added on top of this. Um, is I've got the speed of that arpeggiator, mm -hmm. and, and right now it's it's not tied to the metric, so it's like the free rate. One of the things about this little speech guy is there, there's a speed, but I think what it's doing is it's got little pre-recorded phonemes that it's running through a filter. So it's kind of just doing the real true, you know, you slow it down and change the pitch of it as well. Um, so I've actually ganged up the speed of those phonemes of the, that playback and then correlated that with the rate of the arpeggiator. So as it, as it sweeps through those block chords faster, it's actually doing kind of like a real to real tape slowing down of the so I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold these down. So hopefully you can see them both on the screen at the same. Yeah. And so what you get then is this just really, oop, um, there we go. Yeah. And you know, that, that can be hours of fun right there that's fantastic i i love this idea of just like full randomizing certain parameters and then having these other parameters that are really straightforward and linear it's such a great combination and your conceptual description of why that works is also perfect just that the the more linear parameters kind of bring it down to reality even if it's sort of like a hyper version of reality but it gives it sort of like, like a more unified identity to have certain things that are just straightforward to kind of balance out the, the more randomized or the more Nancaro-esque inhuman characteristics of the gesture. 
I think you know, when, you know, anytime you're dealing with electronic music, you know, in any way, you know, there's there's all these discourses, obviously, you know, there's the, you know the, these histories. I, I'm, I think of someone like like Stockhausen and that notion of sort of total serialism, right? And it's like, all right, well, I'm going to sort of serialize, you know, the spatial position to the timbre, to the octave, to the note, to the to the rhythmic value, etc. And you know, these notions of you know, is this just kind of this like megalomaniac, like total control thing, you know, this kind of top down thing, which does have these, I think, strain. Well, not strange, but I think, you know, important kind of like ideological questions, you know, versus these more kind of like bottom up, like, well, maybe if there is some cor correlation, this can feel in this kind of paraphrasing the Eno thing or even or even someone like Ori Spiegel, I think, you know, in a way, this idea that it's actually more of a grassroots relationship. So it's not necessarily that you're trying to control the instrument or sort of like exercise your will on it, but you're trying to create these organic correlations that maybe make it feel more real or hyper real. But I think it, it also allows these things to kind of take root in a way that feels, you know, uh, hopefully like less trivial or, you know, can kind of really sort of spark something uh, when you're mm -hmm. engaging. Yeah. 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 Cool. So again, before moving on, we've got a sort of a pile of questions from this <laughs> channel. Yeah. Um, is there, is there anything else you wanted to, to show before we do that? You know, maybe I'd just say just on, on, on this one, just to kind of like drive the point home. Um, is that, you know, this, this other little, um, yeah, is actually, so this system is actually the same idea. And actually this is almost identical, random and chord into arpeggiator and, um, or, oh, and I, I guess I would just show one, one other thing. And then, yeah, and then I think questions would be a great idea. Is, is that this is one other Max for Live object that I made that I, I kind of uh, sort of built off the, um, actually just as a plug. Um, for anyone that's interested in kind of this type of thing, Ableton has this really great uh, building tools. Uh, there's a great like Ableton pack um, called building tools that you can download. And it gives you really nice, you know, here's an API mapped LFO. Here's, you know, it does a lot of the, the kind of like, um, you know, the mapping, you know, one parameter to another one. And mm -hmm. all this one does is it's just, and I sort of built this off that is just when it receives a MIDI note, it will generate sort of a random CC or a random data value and you can slew it. Um, so, you know, you can make it, rather than just hopping, you can make it sort of fade. So in this particular instrument, what it does, every time I play a note, it generates a new value, and then that's mapped over to the arpeggiator speed. And kind of for any of the modular synth people, it's like very much like a make noise wackle bug, or like, you know, like a sample it hold into a noise. So it gives a pulse, it gives you a random value. And, you know, so you can... Each gesture is triggered by a single note. Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Um, so I think this is a great general question. How do you go about starting an arrangement with such a diverse and complex set of instruments? <laughs> Ooh, man. All right. That, well, yeah, that's, it's funny. That's a great question and probably a good pivot. And I mean, it's funny. I think, um, also that everything, I think when, when we get up and we chat, you know, kind of these like, sort of just like, man, you know, what on earth am I doing with all these, these stupid bleep blue, you know, <laughs> um, Right, so I, th I think that's the, the core, right? And both how do you build something out of this? You know, how do you go from instrument to arrangement to track to performance to discography to anything? And um, actually, as a plug too, um, so I promise I will answer this question, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, there's a great book by Adam Harper um, called Infinite Music. And he, he talks a lot about kind of like the Mark Fell thing, like the, the, these notions of maybe in a way, I think this relates to even a Pauline Oliveras type thing of, you know, kind of the early feedback back machines as instruments into kind of a deep listening practice and the way these things intersect between attacks on instrument, composition, genre, piece, etc. But I think one of the things that um, for me, and I imagine for a lot of us, when I came to electronic music from, you know, being in a band or playing guitar, doing these things, there's always this kind of like implicit received wisdom of like, okay, maybe I'll write a song or I'll write a lead sheet and I'll write a piece and we'll rehearse it. And then this can sort of manifest in a live iteration when we perform it, maybe we can sort of document it in an album. Maybe there'll be some post-production. It will be a, an idealized representation, but there's, there's always kind of like a very, I think like obvious received kind of conceptual relationship between what how all these parts work both in the micro and the macro so one of the things i think i really struggled with when i came to this even before i was getting into this like hyper conceptual you know materiality of midi or any of this nonsense you know you know it's just like you know what the, what on earth am i doing with this you know like how do i and you know because i i'm i love you know a lot of like like you know, like Chicago house, Detroit techno, like footwork, you know, boom bap, you know, all these things are, 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 you know, and then, you know, silver apples and all these things that sort of relate to the medium as this functional, the Ableton DAW session is the way, the factory in which you make sort of the 
and I, I don't mean the same sort of like capitalist critique, whatever, but you know, the, the, the product, the thing that then goes into the album, you know, if, if this is more of a site of like investigation of playing with the materiality of these objects, then yeah, like what do you do with it? And I, I've always been very, and this is maybe just me being decisive, uh, indecisive, is that, you know, I've never really felt a lot of resonance with like, all right, well, let me turn on record and let me just like bash out some MIDI and then, you know, I'll do the Ableton thing where I play with it here and then I'll, you know, record it into this thing, you know, you know actually here, record something. Um, but, you know, and then like, here's the intro and then I'll put the marker and it's like, oh, here's the drop. And then we'll go from the, the shred guitar into the bleep bleep clippy voice, you know. And, and I, I feel like that has never really worked for me. And, you know, maybe there is some sort of ideological, like, I don't, do you, do you remember that scene? Maybe Danny, y'all see that? I think it was something like that Mozart, the Amadeus movie, where he's like sitting at the piano and he's like, and now the flutes, you know? And then, you know, he jots that. You know, I, I, I don't feel any sort of like, you know, great communion with the MIDI gods that will tell me, you know, at like, you know, bar 12 and a half, you know, then there needs to be a sound effect. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like kind of more like there's that, um, that like no ideas button things type thing. So I, th I think one of the things that, that has worked for me this notion of kind of play, of just experimenting, you know, of, you know, I think as, as all of us do. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll actually, you know, make these very simple max patches outside of Ableton, kind of pipe gener very simple generative MIDI in, and I'll kind of make these structures. Uh, and typically what I'll do, and I, you know, I think really I've, in some ways I've been doing this for a really long time, and in other ways this is all, I think probably is around maybe 2000, I don't know, like 15, 16, 17, I think I really started finding my footing in a lot of this. Um, but, um, you know, I think I've been doing this for long enough where I'm starting to really sort of self-reflexively sort of see how I'm working in the big picture. So, so I'll, I'll play around with these things. I'll make these instruments, I'll make these systems. And typically, you know, if I get something good, I'll just record it. And what I end up with, and you know, this kind of like, I don't mean this in the, the Aphex twin like machismo, you know, I've got 30 albums on released, mm -hmm. but you know, just run off tons and tons of little snippets of, of these recordings. And I'll, I'll just, you know, build up this archive of, of stuff. And then we can just take one at random. And then, you know, sometimes what I can do, you know, is then I can go back and rather than, you know, and I can bring them back and like, I actually don't even know. What... All right, okay, uh, yeah, weirdly, I remember this one from ages ago. I think this is when Massive X came out. <laughs> so this is random MIDI from Max going into Ableton through a scale constraint, et cetera. And then, but, you know, so then I might just kind of listen to that. And I feel like it's, I, I kind of feel like there's that, what, what's that, that that tacky kind of like the, the block of marble and Dave, and you kind of just have the block of marble and you can kind of listen to it. And maybe if you just kind of put yourself in, in, in a, a mind space where you're kind of receptive to it, you can start to start hearing what works. And then I'll sort of kind of let that dictate. So rather than here's the intro, you know, this is kind of like the, the John Cage, you know, uh, form is a bridge from nowhere to nowhere. Um, you know, so I can say like, all right, well, here's, all right, here's a section that's one minute long. And a lot of times what I might do even is I'll turn that into, you know, Ableton's got that really wonderfully terrible, but really generative. You can turn the audio into MIDI. What I might do is then take that and then turn that into MIDI and then take that MIDI rather than just kind of mapping that to an instrument. I might run that through some of these, these kind of processes. And then maybe we'll kind of hold those up together and kind of see, you know, maybe this is something. And then almost like, you know, kind of like, you remember those old like 90s, like scholastic utopian, um, like biology transparency pages where it's like the, the queer pages and, you know, here's the skeletal system and here's the, 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 the circulatory system or whatever. And then, you know, you kind of start seeing those and you start seeing these points of resonance and then maybe it will be generative and then maybe I can just kind of tape claw style sort of kind of, you know, sculpt that a little. Right. I mean, that's, I love that process where it's, I, I like the archival element of it where you're sort of low stakes, just saving moments of your uh, messing around with this stuff. But then I also like that the process is a cycle between a sort of traditional tape collage, start to end, you know, working in a DAW timeline and the more instrumental version, or, you know, kind of like the more modular synth way of using Ableton with all of these MIDI processing and randomness and, uh, you know, uh, improvising triggers and stuff like that. Um, but I like that by sort of bringing it back around to the audio to MIDI thing, it it creates a loop where you're always going back and forth between the two uh, yeah. types of, the two ways of working. Yeah, yeah, be beautifully said. Um, and I, I, th I think that's exactly the case. You know, I, I feel like that there is, you know, 
this kind of linear pipeline that's sort of implicit. And, you know, I think I think even Jeremy Lanier talks a lot about like um, this idea of lock-in. You know, the way that these kind of like design choices and these sort of theoretically open system, you know, kind of, you know, then kind of constrain these things, you know, it's like, oh, you can do anything, but you know, what, what's the time signature, what's the, you know, what's the BPM or what, you know, what key is it? And you can play any key, but you know, it's like, oh, well, all music is now in Western kind of note-based things. Um, or even more generally, I guess the, the, the salient point here is that I think there's sometimes this implicit pipeline of, you know, start with your four bar loop, assemble it in the arrange, bounce it out, put it in the thing, put it on the album. But the way that these things can sort of manifest in this kind of circular way feels feels really exciting. Yeah. 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 So hopping back to the questions, so we have a couple people asking about controllers and uh, and gear. So without getting too uh, gear heady about it, I do think it's important to chat about it though, because so much of uh, what we're talking about is like what gestures are put out. So I think it's worth thinking about what gestures are you putting in and what kind of ways have you experimented with that? So yeah, what gear do you use and 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 yeah, how does it fit into this? I don't really use much. And, and part of that's sort of ideological and part of it's just because I'm, you know, typically pretty broke. Um, but one of the things that I was really interested in, this, like going back to this question of embodiment, is, you know, there's that kind of cliche also of, you know, the live laptop performance looking like someone's just kind of checking their email. And, you know, and there's this kind of like, you know, kind of controllerism, you know, of someone that's going to like emotionally twist the knob that's changing the filter. And, you know, be, you know because they want sort of the, uh, the pyrotechnics and the sweat and, you know, the, the, the feeling of, and, you know, I think what's interesting is to kind of work against that and to realize that, well, checking your email is actually a very embodied action too. It's just not a traditionally sexy one. And you can sort of recast that so what I'm really interested in is actually, I feel like there, there's a rule that I will, going back to that, I will always, if I'm playing MIDI, it will always be on my physical computer keyboard in the little, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, QWERTY keyboard, because it gets me away from any pianistic kind of sort of performance gesture. Um, actually, here, I can show you all something. One second, I'm going to hop up from this. This will be fun. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so I think this is actually the sum total of the gear I own. This is a rolly block. Uh, if Red is watching this, thank you, Red. Um, but it's a nice little XY pad. And there's been a few, it lets you get three channels of CC in. Uh, so one is pressure, one is X, and one is Y. Um, and I will do a lot of things where maybe on the onset that will trigger a note. And then maybe going back to, to this thing where you're ganging up things, maybe X could be the speed of the arpeggio, then, you know, the pressure could kind of be amplitude and timbre, what have you. This is a, a, a Fader Fox, what is this, the, some, the LV2. Actually, this, this was gifted by, by Mort Subotnik, so it's a cherished kind of thing. And it's also, it's got this cute little joystick. This is actually, I can give you a, a real example rather than a hypothetical, is this kind of instrument, which is just an FMS Actually, that, that one's not terribly interesting, but this is another case of, of gesture where this, you know, I've done this pretty much in the last, I think probably in just about every performance over the last few years, is this little joystick on the top. Typically, I'll correlate up and down um, to the speed of, of the tremolo cutoff and then scale to the timbre as well. So as it gets faster, the timbre will change. And then left to right will be the frequency of the modulating oscillator and the panning. So the, it is kind of this, like, not gestural in the sense of any acoustic instrument, but sort of maybe a hyper real gesture or, or really an abstraction of a gesture. I love that, <laughs> that <laughs> it's the tiniest joystick. You're, yeah. you're like yeah. micro oh, emoting I, into this tiny joystick. Oh, I love it. I, yeah, actually, my, my dad actually is just this brilliant, you know, is a musician, but you know, I, I think not like a professional musician, but it's also this very brilliant, brilliant kind of craftsman, this very like innovative, you know, he's got, he's got a CNC, he does some Arduino stuff. Uh, so I've, I've been trying to sort of coerce him into making, you know, if I ask him if I could commission him to build me a better joystick controller, <laughs> he's he's resisting so far. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then you just kind of a, a nano control, which is, you know, pretty much you know, map the sliders to the volume. So yeah, gear, gear wise, nothing terribly exciting, but yeah, that's, that's kind of the rundown of it. Uh, so, and then otherwise, yeah, just Max, Ableton, and then just kind of whatever sort of tacky commercial VSTs I can get my hands on. Yeah. Excellent. Do, do you want to do the next question? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read this one as written because I think it's it's well said. So 
Uh, how do you decide how to present these sound systems slash algorithms? Is it built into the way you construct them in some way? In what ways and how do you decide on the whole that you want to put forward, say, in the form of a track slash piece? So curious as to your process around this. Gosh, is, isn't isn't that the big one? Who, who asked that? Yeah, gosh, that's the question. Um, you know what? Maybe, maybe we do a two-part. Hopefully, I don't glitch out, but I want to both show you all this for trivia's sake, kind of to, to substantiate a previous answer. And then actually, because I think that's a, a really good pivot um, to, to a large one. I think this is something that, that you and I've talked about a lot too, is that I think with any type of generative music or, or any really any type of sort of making these systems, it becomes surprisingly easy, I think, to get like a nice little like soupy, uh-oh, did I? No, I'm still there. Um, you know, kind of soupy, okay, here's the little clippy voice and it's making these gestures and it's this nice kind of diatonic soup or whatever. Um, but the idea, right, of how do you extrapolate it into these larger systems? Um, you know, and, and one of the ways I've arrived at is kind of this, I don't know, live tradition is maybe a little grandiose, but you know, of experimentation into kind of archive and into tape collage. And, and then here, I wanna actually give a brass tax answer to the, then how does that translate into a performative situation or presentation situation or what have you. But I think what's interesting too is, is the relationship, uh, which I think is a really good one that, you know, doesn't get dealt with in a very intentional way sometimes, is how does even the process of composition relate to like, thinking ahead to like, what is the site or the point of engagement with this, both as an audience and as a, as a performer or present, presenter, what have you. And I, I think one of the things, I, I've definitely felt this as a person tuning into previous versions of these series, I think sometimes there's this like nerd machismo of like building like the, the, the perfect patch, you know, of like, oh, if only I had like a better generative sequencer, you know, with all these different subroutines, and then it would go into this thing, and then it would do the pads, and then it would do the fortissimo gestures, then it would do the cadenza, and then it would do the the the, the pump fake drop into the like transformer sound, you know. <laughs> and I, you know, I think there's something to that. You know, ideally I would like to make to extend these systems. So it's not just one little kind of zone, but one thing that can deal with like sort of logics that deal with many zones, these kind of meta structures. So it's not sculptural in the terms of the materiality of one instrument but it's dealing with these relationships, the other one. And just as an aside, I feel like this is something I could talk about for hours, but I don't wanna steer us away from that question. But I do wanna, um, there, there's a really great sequencer that Intelligent Music put out in the late 80s, early 90s called M. And it's actually, it was, I think it was initially for the Atari and got ported. And then you can Google search this on the cycling website. You can actually download a version that still works. It'll still pump out MIDI and it's great. And it's like, four channels generative sequencers with interrelated parameters. I actually cloned it in Max a while back. Um, so for a while I got into this idea of like, I do need to make the, the, the larger sequencer. I need to make the perfect sequencer that will make these kind of pastel plastic symphonies for me. And you know, that's still kind of something I'm working on, but I want to make sure that I'm not chasing a red herring in that and really going after things that feel like interesting conceptual inquiry, but are also just like functional. And sorry, this is where it pivots into like actually the real part of the answer. You know, the idea of like, all right, well, how can I take this? So this is actually, this is the the second or third track on the last Orange Milk album. So maybe some of y'all recognize this. So this one, and you know, so this this is kind of a mixture of kind of the things like we were looking at before, flattened audio tape collage, then, you know, various MIDI derived from that, and you know, all put out in the timeline. But then, sorry, this is a very, very long-winded wind up to answering that question. You know, the idea of like, all right, well, I wanna play it, you know, play a show, how I perform this. And you know, and there's always that notion, right, of sort of live algorithmic performance versus like, oh, well, they just press space bar on the thing. And I think I'm somewhere in between, I, I think, you know, there are points, you know, granted where I will just take a section, it will be on rails and I'll hit the play button. And, you know, it's the most boring, lamest, cheating kind of thing. But what I'm excited about this, and this goes back to the circular thing, is one of the things I'll find is I'll find excerpts from this. And I'll actually tend to work backwards. So rather than starting the track here and then bringing it over here, I'll actually usually compose here. But what's cool is that Ableton has this really nice, and I imagine a lot of us already kind of know this, is you can take something, you can highlight a section and you can right click and you can say consolidate time to new scene. And then it will actually, this, well, this will go pretty fast. It will then actually take that slice of time. And I think this is worth actually letting it spin out. 
and then it's going to take this and it's going to hop this back and it's going to construct a um ableton calls it a, a scene yeah it's going to make a scene for us yeah so it'll actually make the scene that you can launch out then what's fun in addition to looping this you can set different start points than different loop points so oftentimes what i'll do is i'll set up the scene so maybe a gesture of just like you know some sort of impact into kind of like a more rhythmic figure is i'll then take it so they all start this little excerpt will start together but then i'll loop just the tail end of it and then maybe i'll take all of those tracks and i'll have them loop at different rates so i can take sort of a macro gesture fire that off you know as a, as a as a scene and then at the end of that gesture they'll actually start looping but they'll start looping kind of like phase style so each time they loop they'll actually evolve and change these rhythmic patterns so i can go from something sort of pre-composed and actuate that and then set myself up with kind of this sort of live kind of bed that then i could improvise over with those other instruments and and, and that's that's sort of like the core of the live show and the, the, the other fun thing too is you can get really really deep with the different follow actions and the different kind of legato actions you can do all sorts of crazy things where like maybe when you go to the next scene will it start from the beginning or will it pick up from the transport of that individual clip and then crossfade into the next one um so oftentimes there is a lot of pre-composition in the live sets where it really is kind of taking all these different disparate gestures and then sort of folding them down accordion style into this thing that's very spring loaded that i can step through that is partially on rails then partially these different things that i can interact with and kind of cue but then go into this more algorithmic more kind of faux generative thing live right um, you know yeah. that that ties into something that's come up at a lot of these other master classes uh mark fell and malitzen both kind of said something along the lines of how for certain live sets, you need this balance between having something that's reliably good and mm -hmm. something that you feel like you can have an influence on while it happens live. So this is a really interesting strategy where, you know, you hit the button and the event happens and it's, it's what you want it to be every time. But then after that, it, there's some randomness involved. And also, like you said, you get, to, you get to sort of hop in and do something more improvisatory and spontaneous. Yeah, you know, and it's funny, right? And it's, it's, you know, you know, it's strange. I thought this is something. That, I mean, I, I'm, I think I'm still, you know, uh, all of us are, you know, perpetually chewing through. But I think something that I feel like I was was able to kind of find my peace with was that, you know, in the same way that when you're, you know, the guitarist in a band, um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, sort of received wisdom about what your relationship to kind of the production, the actualization of, you know, any sort of musical, performative, whatever event is you know the metaphor you have it's like oh i'm the guitarist in the band that's what i do into the metaphor whereas with this right you really have to sort of stake a metaphorical or conceptual relationship to your materials and to your audience into the site of performance so this idea of like is the laptop my instrument is the laptop sort of a bucket that contains multiple instruments is the laptop in the able to is this the and the one i think i found is kind of it's a chamber ensemble and i'm sort of the conductor and then occasionally i can kind of like step in and be the soloist that plays the cadenza in between those but then also there, there are there are all these questions I and mean, there is kind of this sometimes i think can be sort of a nerd machismo of like what was the most live or you know that you know live mm -hmm. modular daw list said like, mm -hmm. but then you know also just you know what's i think we've even talked about this in our own practices you know just what's interesting to us you know because you know, no one wants to sit there and hit space bar and just sit there. And he actually, you know, it's, it's funny too, maybe we were talking about this. I, I learned this recently in programming. There's this thing called, uh, and maybe someone smarter than me can correct me on this, but my understanding is there's this thing called the XY problem. And the idea is that you're trying to solve sort of problem Y and you get in your mind that, you know, that, that you need solution X. Like if only I had a better generative sequencer, then I could do the best live show ever, you know, Y. And you find yourself sort of chasing these red herring things that are actually not even you know, it's all built on a false assumption. So they just, oh, I only need to make it more live and then it will be a better performance. And, you know, I think it's, it's very easy to sort of chase these conceptual, bit. you know, maybe interesting things will happen along the way. But I, I think the thing, which is funny, is I feel like in, in my own practice, I feel like very, felt very kind of contrarian, you know, like, you know, oh, I don't want to do this very conservative, you know, linear progression of a piece and there'll be a starting beginning and an end, you know, and that felt very banal to me. But, you know, the other things I'm finding is like, that's actually kind of okay. You know, sometimes there is, you know, a, 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 a 30 minutes that I do want to kind of offer a compelling journey through. And, you know, before before COVID, you know, maybe at some point this could have been to the VR mm -hmm. stuff. For a while, I was making these, you know, kind of have another sort of parallel practice working in kind of uh, virtual environments that ties in with spatial sound and everything. But, you know, we do the thing, you know, where sometimes you, 
the person's a, a boring live performer, so you offer some sort of visual pyrotechnics. And I think what's interesting is that even the implicit sight of a performance, you know, a performer's on stage, the audience sits over there and drinks PBR is kind of an artifice too. So what I would end up doing was I would make these 3D environments, I'd bring a second computer and I would just actually ask someone from the audience, usually someone I hadn't rehearsed with or really even was expecting to perform that night. I would just ask them to walk through these virtual environments that made kind of like a video game, you know, just arrow keys and mouse, whatever. And I would just project that, you know, and, and, that, and I think that was nice because it would offer some sort of spectacle that could be compelling and hopefully aesthetically engaging. But I also like just it, for, for my own entertainment, finding ways to sort of rupture the like, you know, oh, they're just sitting there with laptops. Isn't that boring? And, you know, in my mind, it's like, well, they're just sitting there with laptops. And isn't maybe isn't that a thing that, you know, maybe could that be interesting, actually? <laughs> yeah, it's funny because it seems like the problem to be solved there sometimes feels more like how can I be busy enough to justify this as a performance rather than the question of like, what would any sort of spontaneity actually change about this piece? Like, is it still just, you know, hitting the right notes? Do I have only kind of loose control over the pacing of the whole thing, but it's still going to be essentially the same every time. But I, mm -hmm. I like that uh, alternative. What should I be doing during this live show? I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Oh, totally. You know, it, it's funny. I feel like it, it kind of ties in with this weird sort of equation of like virtuosity, I think, with virtue in a way, you know, or this idea of, of like excellence, of like, oh, what, you know, what a killer shot. They were so good. You know, it's kind of almost this like athletic type of excellence, mm -hmm. you know, or, or even, you know, it's funny, you know, not, not even as like a sort of false humility type thing, but, you know, it's funny, even the notion of like teaching like a master class right now. It's like, you know, like, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, <laughs> like in a way, I mean, I think I, I feel like I'm sort of like, you know, like the horse whisperer, I'm like the bleep loop whisperer. And, you know, really, you know, the idea is that, you know, it's kind of like a Cajun thing or, you know, of, or, you know, even, and again, even maybe from Sophie thing, you know, of just like finding yourself enamored with the materiality of various things and then kind of allowing yourself to be receptive to what those materials could tell you and then just helping them along, you know, rather than sort of dictating any sort of top down, you know, and now I shall organize them into, you know, bleep opus, you know, number seven. Um, but, you know, just kind of being a conduit in a way um, has always felt, felt better. Mm. Yeah. I think maybe we should talk about VR a little bit. Yeah. Um, so Brad, Brad Shermer asked, uh, how does your music making change or augment when working in VR? That's a great question. Um, that, that's a, gosh, that's a big question. <laughs> um, I, I think there's, the, you know, it's funny. There, there's two ways that in some ways feel s sort of separate, kind of like the line of demarcation actually being kind of COVID in a way. Um, but also they're related, maybe to, to first sort of tie it back to the practice. I remember a few years uh, ago, kind of even before VR was sort of becoming a thing, uh, my friend was talking about like, oh, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be great if, you know, you could just kind of get in virtual, out, virtual reality and, you know, run around Ableton and play the instruments. Um, and, you know, in my mind, it's kind of like, well, no, that's not, what, why? <laughs> you know, like I can already, I can already bash the MIDI notes, you know, like what, what sort of, you know, embodiment would that give me? I don't want to, you know, do like the, 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 the Wiimote lightsaber, you know, playing, you know, operator preset number four, you know, <laughs> like, you know, why, why would that be interesting? Um, but, but I think what's exciting to me is to kind of take that, that sort of Sophie-esque idea of the materiality, the tactility of these objects, both in, not in, even in terms of like emotionally twisting the knob as a performer, but just the idea that they have, uh, you know, a, a taste to them. Uh, virtual reality to me, like, became very interesting in, in the same way that synth presets give you, tell you a lot about the communities that are making them and who have agency over them, kind of the larger cultural context. So I was working as a studio assistant more at Subotnik from I think probably about like maybe late 15 or 16 into about 18. So we went down to Moogfest uh, in 2016, which is I think right when a lot of VR was kind of, you know, kind of hitting the mainstream. One of the things that was on display there was this was this kind of like Netflix branded virtual reality experience. Um, and you'd put on the headset and you went in this kind of like lovingly rendered virtual reality cabin. You know, you'd look out the, the, the virtual window and you'd see, you know, the VR snow and there's like a VR fireplace. And then inside of it is this giant <laughs> virtual reality television. And you sit down on the VR couch and you watch VR television. So <laughs> it's just like the most high budget, 
dumbest failure of imagination where you've done this amazing new 3D medium to watch a 2D medium <laughs> in a way that completely bypasses any of the creative affordance of it. So yeah. to me, that actually became very inspiring. Yeah. Was like, all right, you know, what does this tell us as kind of like going back to that idea of like ready-made sculptures or kind of these Rauschenberg-esque assemblages of signifier of media. The way you could sort of place a thing in virtual space to me actually feels very organically related to the, um, or oh, I guess I changed able to, but to, the, to that purple wizard, you know, all these objects kind of have like a taste or a materiality or a tactility um, that, that tells us something and that can be a very sort of playful, generative, just decontextualization, or it can be an, a critical engagement with, you know, the technology. And, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm not, I don't know how to program, you know, everything I know is like very self-taught, you know, just from chain smoking cigarettes and watching YouTube tutorials. When I was watching these tutorials, you know, they give you these, these, Things like, oh, here's how you select something from a menu. And you, the way you learn it is you shoot the menu thing with a, with a virtual reality gun. You know, and, you know, it's, it's, you know every, every art and technology banal critique of like, well, look how they're steering you towards this. You don't even know anything with it. And you already learned how to shoot guns, et cetera. But um, anyway, sorry, to tie this back. The thing I'm interested with, with music and VR is very much not that like, there's so many banal, you put on the headset and you play like a VR xylophone and isn't that fun. But to me, what I'm excited about with VR is that it feels like a very media rich continuation of this notion of the materiality of instruments and, and media objects. And the other thing is how that ties in with spatial sound. And I think this is a, also a very kind of cheap discourse, though there is some truth to it, is that, you know, there's this whole history of acousmatic music or, you know, surround sound, you know, you have to have access to the spatial, you have to go to the school where you can have the 10 speakers where you can make the piece. But because a lot of VR has very cheap built-in sound, you can actually start engaging with this history of experimental music practice in a way that's like counterintuitively surprisingly accessible. And with platforms like Mozilla Hubs, and I, I promise I'll show a little bit of this before we end, it's free, it's all browser-based. You don't need any software, you don't even need a headset. You know, anyone can start making, you know, these experimental spatial sound installations. So to me, it feels like, ah, sorry, it's more of an essay than I intended, but you know, it's the, it's the intersection of an accessible way of dealing with these kind of specialized practices. And it's a window into these larger questions of equity and agency and signifier in, in, in very rich hyper real media space. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, that's a great answer. I, it really ties back into the first thing you talked about today. It's great. Actually, I mean, you, you mentioned it, it'd be great to see something. Yeah, let's, let's try it. Let's see. All right, so... Um, um, so while this is queuing up, uh, one of the things that I've been really excited about, uh, one of the platforms, is there's this platform called Mozilla Hubs. And what it is, it's a web VR platform. So essentially, you can kind of go to a website, and that website will be a 3D environment. And they've already kind of, Mozilla has already done sort of the back end, where if you have a virtual reality headset, you can actually just go to the website and it will render that in VR, and you can walk around it in your headset, and you can do your kind of like cyber whatever. But if you don't, you can just literally go to the same website on your computer or your smartphone and walk around with it video game style. And it's all cross compatible. So when you're present in these spaces, you'll see everyone else that's there as an avatar. And, you know, you can have one person in a VR headset, you can have one person on their phone, one person on their computer, and they can all interact with each other. One of the things we've been doing since the pandemic is actually doing a lot of performances and shows and installations. This is a group show curated by, um, uh, synthesis gallery in Berlin. And my piece beyond designing this 3D space was this the sound sculpture. Um, so what you're going to see here in a second is this 3D kind of assemblage of objects that I downloaded. You know, so you can kind of, same way you can go to Splice, there's just tons of these 3D object drivers. So I've kind of made this visual assemblage and then I've animated them. Kind of, And again, I feel like this all relates to the compositional practice where they have these different trajectories that move the sound in space that are all of different lengths. So it's kind of almost like a Calder mobile or, you know, an Eno thing or a phase piece or what. And so really it's, 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 it's music for airports and virtual reality really is what it is. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I'm like the Eric Andre, let me in. All right, if this doesn't work out in, in just a few seconds, I'll play a video of it. But I think it'd be fun to show you all this in real time. Yeah, maybe while this is queuing, are there, are there other questions I could speak to? Here's, here's again, kind of a nuts and boltsy question. Somebody's asking about this, a Logic Pro user is interested in getting interested, uh, getting involved in algorithmic composition, asking if he needs to switch to Ableton and using Max for live. But yeah, do you know anyone working on this kind of stuff with maybe Max 
through Logic or or Max through other software? Or uh, overall, what are your thoughts on? Um, I don't know. Does this have to happen in Ableton? I mean, I feel like Ableton is nice because it does give you a lot of nonlinearity, and you know, the Max for Live, you know, Im- embedding is very nice. But I, I, I think, you know, may, maybe this is me being the, the cartoon grizzled guy in the guitar center saying, you know, you can do anything you want with, you know, with a squire or whatever, you know, is, I mean, there's a million ways you can do it. You know, algorithmic music, I think it's worth being aware of the kind of the nerd machismo of like, you know, watching like the Richard Devine Instagram too much. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, I need, you know, the coolest, but an algorithm is just, you know, a system, you know, if you put two loops of different lengths and let them play out, you know, that's an algorithmic, comp- you know, so, I mean, I think it's worth kind of envisioning like what is the end result do you want rather than that X, Y of like, Oh, I need some cool algorithms. So that, that was sort of the long windy answer. The, the short answer is yes, you can totally do it in logic. I think actually the, the way I work in Jacob, I think the way you work too is like both of us will rather than doing a lot of max for live, we'll run max sessions outside of Ableton and pipe MIDI into it. So if you've already got like a workflow with, with logic, you can totally pick up max as a sidecar, send that MIDI or what, whatever you want to do you know, into logic and still kind of build off what you know. So yeah, I, I, I think there, there's rarely any sort of like, oh, well, you have to have this thing. Right, so the, the stuff you showed today was very much like inter Ableton. But I, I agree that the way that I work is mostly stuff in Max and then using Ableton just as sort of like a, a location for MIDI instruments and as a general place to hold, like edit recorded MIDI and things like that, yeah. so, which Logic would do exactly the same. Yeah, and let's see, actually, um, before um, my computer might kind of like start uh, catching fire soon, trying to render all this. Cool. So maybe um, maybe what I'll do is I'll mute it and kind of give us the tour, and so I'm not shouting over it, and then I'll, I'll throw the sound on. Yeah, so this is this right now what you're seeing, this is an environment that, that, that I kind of assembled. Uh, it just lives in the browser, and then here is this sculpture kind of like showing my influence on the sleeve on my sleeve called the, the fountain um though also bracket i don't think duchamp actually made the fountain there's that whole discourse <laughs> about patriarchy and it wasn't him and it was you know be, beware of of papa avant-garde um but in any case um this is the sort of sculpture that i've assembled um and there's a few different moving parts there's these different spheres that have these different trajectories there's these different rings that move there's this particle system um, in kind of like a Calder mobile or, or an Eno-esque, you know, music for airport situation, each one of these is on a trajectory of a different length. In each one of those, when I unmute it, you'll hear, we'll have a sound associated with it of a different length. So they, it's a very cheap generative system where it will always recombine into these infinite permutations. But the other fun thing is, I, I don't know how well this will come through the screen share, but each of those has a sound. So as you move through the space, you'll actually hear a, a sound sculpture. So, you know, it, rather than you know needing to go to MPAC or go to like Stime or, or, or Karma Lab or any of these things, you can make a surround sound piece you know literally in your browser for for free you know, for nothing, uh, which is which is really really hugely exciting I think. And then for this particular piece, we actually allowed people to come and add their own sounds to the fountain. So we did kind of a 24 hour event, which is fun. But let me just stop yapping for a second. I'll turn the sound on, kind of just walk you around for a second. Yeah, I know that's kind of a universe unto itself. Is there anything that would be useful to sort of speak to about that, I wonder? Well, first, just one thing that popped into my head, you know, thinking back to Brad's question earlier about how VR changes the way you work with this. This seems like such a perfect example of how you're kind of using some of the same ways of thinking, but the overall structure and format of the piece is completely different because it's in VR. The fact that there's no beginning and ending, the fact that the audience has control over the spatial characteristics of the sound. So it's, it's just a really interesting spectrum to see like when you're working on this kind of stuff as music and when you're working on it as something else. That actually feels like the third reason I think this feels very exciting beyond all those you know, spatial sound, you know, investigation of objects, et cetera, but is these structural questions. Um, and I remember when I was in graduate school, I remember I like was bashed my head against the wall for ages and I, I ended up writing this 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 what's the, you know, the the always sunny in philadelphia meme where he's pointing to the conspiracy theory like um, one of those about this notion of 
you know, even with kind of like silver apples or like you know, that early notion of recorded media, right? Not being a representation of an event. It's not documentation, but it's an artifact unto itself. And the way that kind of created this new format for composition. So it's it's an artifact. It's not a documentation, you know, in the same way that like photography problematized painting and allowed this abstraction. This notion then of not even something where like, all right, well, I've made this algorithmic piece of music and then eventually I have to flatten it down, you know, into a session that will come out on a band camp or maybe I'll perform those algorithms live. But this notion of where it lives and what new forms and formats does that bring us to? One of the things that, that's really exciting, and I think we, you know, we've been seeing this and, you know, a lot of like, kind of tech art, you know, is like, you know, the person that makes the website and the website is the piece and, you know, you go and you hear the algorithm. Um, and I think, you know, in kind of science fiction futures, we're going to see, you know, new smart rooms and all these awful, like you go in, you'll hear an algorithmic composition, you know, played by your fridge and your Alexa and, you know, perfect ambisonic sound based off your browser history and, you know, <laughs> all these horrible things. That's all to say, I think what's very exciting is that there are these very, you know, kind of big picture questions of non-linearity and generative music that will happen beyond just the scope of an album versus live performance dichotomy uh, versus, you know, kind of gallery live installation thing. And I think, you know, what, what we might sort of typically perceive as the trope of, you know, the, the, the gallery installation, we're actually going to sort of see more in the mainstream context of our day-to-day -day existence. And, you know, granted that will likely happen in the worst, you know, Amazon Alexa way rather than any sort of more egalitarian way. And you know, maybe as artists and people thinking about this, we can engage with this. Um, I, I think it's allowing kind of these these metaphors that might have been otherwise very esoteric, like a sound sculpture, like a like a sound environment that might have been sort of the purview of just like a rarefied you know gallery install, to actually become sort of a viable way of working. Um, and, and, and to me, I think that feels really exciting, sort of connecting this way of composing in VR in a way that's not just about VR, but about how media immersion as like a, a day to day phenomenon. Uh, is going to sort of blossom over the, the next few, probably like five years even. Um, so it, it feels like there's an extra musical concern there too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Super, super interesting. There's a couple of just like nuts and boltsy kind of questions that I think would be maybe a nice way to, to wrap it up. So first is, can you embed audio into animations in hubs? Um, Maybe that's not as as simple as... Oh, no, 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 actually, no, no, that, that's a great one. Sorry, I just react that way because that's something I've lost sleep over. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, there's probably people that are much better because I, I am very much a Luddite with this stuff. But as far as I know, you can't embed it into the animation itself, but what you can do is sort of pair it. So you can make a 30-second animation of, of a sphere changing the scale, and you can make a 30-second crescendo, and then you can sort of pair those. And then sometimes... Mm. They, they, they'll desynchronize and it's frustrating. But yeah, you, you can fake that. And that, that's something I do a lot. Cool. Yeah. We'll have this be the last question. Somebody's asking about how spatialization in uh, VR type env environments is related to just simple panning. So is it more complex than left, right? Is it more of like an ambisonic uh, sort of simulation of actual three dimensions? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. The, the nuts and bolts answer is yes. And it's like astoundingly well implemented. So it's actually doing a binaural decoding where you're getting elevation. It's doing like a stock HRTF and doing all the, the filtering. So it's not just left, right, but it is actually giving you some kind of filtering and, and, and attenuation. Uh, and under the hood, it's not built in, but it's actually doing a whole ambisonic encoding. So theoretically, if you're savvy with JavaScript, I'm trying to like coerce a bunch of kind of plucky computer scientists up at RPI to help me with this, is that you could decode from that VR environment to a larger one. Oh, wow. Oh, that's yeah. exciting. Cool. Yeah. Matthew, thank you for joining us. This was so fun, uh, as always, when we hang out. Lots of uh, tidbits that will be sticking with me, I'm sure, same uh, for the audience. And uh, every thanks to everyone in the audience for coming and asking fantastic questions and uh, looking forward to seeing everybody at the next event. Yeah. Thank you. All okay. right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.